Hi, this is Phil, and I'm here to tell you all about the Capes and Lunatics Patreon. Don't miss out on our comic book creator interviews, including our monthly Chichester chats with comic book legend D.G. Chichester, superhero movie brackets in our search for the worst comic book movie of all time, and many, many more specials, all completely uncensored. Access starts for $3 a month, full video when you pledge $5 a month. Check out the link in our show notes or go to patreon.com slash capes and lunatics. Hope to see you there. And welcome once again to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor Esser, and with me, as always, is my skinny rich friend. It's Moz. Welcome, Moz. Welcome as we talk about something that just dropped today. I'm very excited. It's apparently at Sundance getting all the raves. Polite Society. Uh, Rhea Khan believes that she must save her older sister, Lena, from her impending marriage. After enlisting her friend's help, she attempts to pull off the most ambitious of all wedding heists in the name of independence and sisterhood. Mm. Our director is Nita Manzor, no relation. Um, Nita, Nita is, Manzor. Nita. As as uh, also the writer on this, our stars include Rita Arya, Ila Brucoleri, and Shobu Kapoor. Um, let's see here. Yeah, Anita Manzor is just the hardest working person in show business on this. Three, three credits. Uh, <laughs> director, writer, and just another writer credit, just because she wrote so much. Oh, so this uh, is like her show. This is her whole... Yeah, I'm guessing so. Well, you know, she's, you know, like you and me, Maz. She is a uh, uh, indie filmmaker who has made good. And, uh, you know, um, I, 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 I endorse this. Um, this looks exciting. It is, you know, it's your, it's your, it's the, at least from the trailer. And that's the thing. And I, and this is actually one of those things, um, that, feeds into magical realism, but also opens up the possibility that what we see in the trailer has nothing to do with what's going to be in the film, <laughs> which is a real possibility when you think about it, you know? Because um, someone said, you know, I really like this. I just wish they didn't give so much away in the trailer. And my first impetus on that is, you know, it's a fair criticism. You know, don't give away so much in the trailer. Just like people said, for the Ant-Man trailer. Hmm. But, you know, I think there is an argument to to the point that the real treasure was the journey. Yeah, I, I think for certain films, um, for example, I just saw the movie Plane the other day, the new Gerard Butler movie, mm -hmm. and it is formulaic as all get out. But it's so good. Like, you just enjoy the, the quippy banter between the characters the relationships between the characters feels real and you enjoy when they say or do things to each other in that little area is where the charm of that film was, even though it, it like, you know, followed every rule about what makes a good action movie to the T and you could predict where everything was going to happen, but you still cared that it was about to happen. Um, so I think Which, with this movie too, when you watch the trailer, the relationships between the characters seem really interesting. You see snippets of it, but immediately you're like, Oh, I wonder what happened in that scene. I wonder what happened in that scene. They made you care. <laughs> um, and again, maybe they're just really good trailer editors, right? Uh, yeah. Justice League looked like it was going to be incredible when the trailer first dropped. So maybe yeah. they're just really good editors, but I feel like the, the real heart and the joy of this movie is going to be taking the ride like you said along with these little kids it reminds exactly. me of, of uh there was an old movie called detroit rock city oh yeah these kids who won kiss tickets and then they lose the tickets and they have to or like harold and kumar it reminds me of those kind of movies um yeah. based on just good friendships good relationships and a silly silly journey yes and and you know i like that and i do wonder how much of this is going to be her fantasy like how much of the how much of the Ooh. 
wedding heist we've seen is actually just her fantasy of how it goes and how much is going to be in the reality. And is there going to be that stark contrast between her imagining herself as this, you know, uh, South Asian woman stunt, stunt person and this adventurous life she imagines mm. and the difficulties involved in becoming that person and the fear that this marriage is going to, you know, ruin her, 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 her relationship with her sister, you know, yeah, yeah. you know, is she not going to want to come out with her to videotape her falling on, uh, on her butt anymore? Yeah. You like know? you get that one scene where you get the bond villers, villain scene went, well, what now, Mr. Bond? And the yes. is coming down, but she's just like, you know, taking hair off of her leg. So it's, it's, it's like yeah. cute, you know, like, uh, and I gotta, I gotta say, I do love, uh, our evil auntie from Miss Marvel Returns, mm-hmm. uh, to be the evil mother in law here. Um, and, you know, I get the I, feeling I, we're gonna see her in, uh, this kind of role for a while. Which oh, is great. Yeah. I think she, I, I'm hoping she enjoys it. She seems to enjoy it. Yeah. You know, that's, it's, it's like, you know, it's like Vincent Price would say. It's like, yeah, I can do a lot of other things, but you know, it's a lot of fun to just, be the evil person, you know, in the corner. And just, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's fun to do it. It's fun to scare the little kids because, <laughs> you know, and quite frankly, if your rent's paid, yeah, why not do that? Yeah. You know? No, scaring kids is a lot of fun. I dress up like uh, like Pennywise on Halloween and sit on my porch still as night until somebody gets too close. And then I just turn my <laughs> head slowly and go, we all float down here, Georgie. We are. And people lose their mind. And it's the best thing in the world. <laughs> it so, is. Yeah. It is. Uh, I, I, uh, I appreciate your commitment to the bit. I don't think I could sit that still that long. Um, <laughs> it's it's like fishing, you know, or yeah. Or honey, no, yeah, I understand but, the premise. I'm just yeah. you know, um, I'm I'm a constant. I need that constant gratification. Mm. You know. <laughs> yeah. That's just me. It's clearly I, I am not a person that waits. I, I it's like it's cooked enough. Eat the food. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, that's why I like my food rare. Um, <laughs> but no, this looks like a lot of fun, and I'm I'm excited for it. I, I just like I said, it's just a random thing. Hey, algorithm, way to go! You said you know what? This is going to be a good connection, mm. a super connection for this show because we got Manzor, Manzor, man, oh man. And we somehow they knew that the show was about to drop. They said, you know what? Get this in Charlie's feed. Just get it there now. Just I'm surprised it move, wasn't move. in my I'm surprised too. But you know what? Maybe you don't uh maybe you don't talk enough about podcasting. I don't know. Outside of your daily life, you know. Yeah, I, I pretty much don't talk about anything on, on, on social media. So yeah. Exactly. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm I'm a lurker, I watch, but I don't share. Yeah. See me, I'm always sharing. I'm a, I'm an oversharer because you know what? I figure if the if the Illuminati is coming for me, I might as well make it easy. You know, it's not the Illuminati that that has ruined the fun for me. Well, you know, I don't know who's ruining any fun. You know, I, it's like a, you know that's the thing for me. I'll be honest with you about algorithms. So much of my of my feed is literally just old TV shows. And, you know, Star Trek memes and things like that, because that's what I like. That's what I interact with, you know? I like to go, hey, you look cool in that Starfleet universe, man. Yeah, no, the algorithm, again, is not my issue. The algorithm's fine. The algorithm works just great. It's people. Yeah. Yeah. That are my problem. Well, you know. Like I said, and I guess, you know, I, I, I have a tendency to only go to boards where they, like, moderate, you know, like, if you're a jerk, they kick you off. Right. And I think that's, that's helpful. You know, it's like if you're not looking to engage with it, it's that you stop being engaged with it, you know, and then suddenly everyone's nice, you know, that's a nice thing. (laughs) Uh, but I did really enjoy that. I'm, I'm excited about it. Um, yeah, it looks really, really good. Yeah, it looks really good. You know, there's not much to go on. It's just a trailer and we don't have a story about these people yet. I don't need more. I, I was sold by the little girl's face when she goes, let's get, I was like, I'm there yes. with you. Let's go. I, that's what sold me. Yeah. And that is, that is a good selling point, you know, and that's shows you how good, how a good actor 
mm. helps the story. You know, you need good actors to sell an outlandish plot. Um, speaking of which, we also got the dropping of the Mandalorian trailer uh, not too long ago. Oh, last week. My, oh my. Mandalorian 3. Um, you know what I like about this? They are continuing, and uh, Jindarin is going back to Mandalore. He's going to bathe in those dang, doesn't care that it's that, that, that the river of Mandalore has dried up due to the, you know, carpet bombing. You know, doesn't care that the great dome of Mandalore is gone. He's like, no, my job is, I, this is what I was told I have to do, to reclaim my honor. And so it'll be there. Hey, at least there is a way back. Exactly. I will leap and the net will appear, you know? And to be fair, that's a good st strategy to have in Star Wars somehow. <laughs> like, it does seem to play out, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess know. those are the stories we do hear about, right? <laughs> yeah, hear about the ones who leap and just go kaplat, you know? Oh, yeah, well, it's, it's like an Andor, the, the people that not, didn't make We, we yeah, saw the good story to made. tell, right? <laughs> yeah, and as far as it turns out, the other on, guy in the, But the, on the, the flip guy, side, too, yeah. unless you jump, you're never part of the story either. Exactly. But the other guy that he's there with at the end of Andor, he actually is also in Rogue One. So they're both in that, apparently. Ah, okay. So it was the same actor. Apparently, that's what, that's what I was told. So um, I still haven't seen Rogue One, which is, is it's funny to me because I know the premise, and I know the plot, and I know all the characters now. And I've seen, like, parts of it. But, man, it's like I'm getting to the point in my life where I can't watch a two-hour movie, honestly. <laughs> at least not at home. I can in the theater. But when I'm home, I'm like, at most, I'm going to watch the two-hour movie, and then I'll fall asleep. Hmm. Or I'm going to watch, you know, part of the two-hour movie, and then I'm going to get bored and do other things, go wash the dishes. And to me, I find that interesting, just in how I interact with it. Um, but yeah, I like this. I like that we see uh, Grogu mm -hmm. turn into the dark side, man. Well, I mean, is that what's happening? Well, or Grogu's bringing balance. I don't know which. I mean, he's just, he's just defending himself, right? Like, yeah. at a certain point, you got to remove the moral implications of, say, hey, man, I'm defending myself. We'll talk about morality later. Right at, right now, this dude showed up with his claws and stuff with, like, the superhero pose. Hey, man, I can't take any chances. I'm just going to put you over. That's all he was doing. If, if we're being, all we saw him do was pick a dude up and just move him. He didn't do anything bad to it yet, right? Right, that we know of, yeah. Okay. <laughs> He's defending his house, man. Yeah. Defending his cave. Although I did hear an interesting theory on this that actually, that actually, the Mandalorian that we're following in this is not supposed to be uh, Jindaran. That Grogu is the Mandalorian. Oh, oh that's Grogu. Cool. Grogu is going to be the force wielding Mandalorian who returns to Mandalore to rule in time. And guide the Mandalorians in a new way. Maybe a the only thing that survived on Mandalore were those little frogs that Grogu loves so much. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, you know, who knows what survived on Mandalore? Although I will say this. It does seem that as hard as life gets on these planets, species survive. And species even thrive. Hmm. You know, you look at a place like Tatooine, that Tatooine that similar, <laughs> similarly had a complete aerial bombardment, completely destroyed what was Tatooine. And that wasn't even the Republic. I think that was like the first, or that wasn't even the Empire. I think that was like, you know, the first Republic or something, you know. That was an early day of some, some trade war or another. And... Yet, you know, the Jawa survived, the Sand People survived, or the Tuscans survived, and, and they all learned to survive in this drastically destroyed ecosystem because they find that the water is still there. Hmm. And I think that's what we're going to see in Mandalore, is that the waters of Mandalore still flow. You hmm. just have to learn where the water flows, and maybe <laughs> that is where Grogu is going to be helpful, because Grogu will Feel the force, feel the flow of the force through all living things. 
And the per- I wonder if you'll find giant sandworms underneath the desert that hold all the water. When Maybe. You <laughs> and then Grogu will just go sleep as he does, you know. And they'll cut open the sandworms and drink all the water. That's funny. Yay! Um, what else was so, it? Did you catch anything else that seemed uh, to tell us what's going to be in the season? Um, well, we see that he's reuniting with uh, the 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 other rogue um, Mandalorian Mandalorians. Well, yeah, what was her name? The one with the red hair. Yeah, I. Uh, it's played by the same actress who did her voice in the cartoon, right? Right. right, right, uh, right. Kaylee Sackhoff. Yes. And I'm blanking on her name now, but um, I'm glad she's back. Yeah. But I also like the fact that it seems that she is um, joining up with 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 Jindarin, That right. he seems like he's got his own posse now. Yeah, it seems like they're going to recognize his right to rule. Because he has, and it's interesting. Oh, right, because, yeah, of course. But, especially compared to time. Well, yeah, of course she has to, but, you know, that's the thing. And and the, I, I do think it's interesting the difference between the way the his people, the armorers, see it. Because the armorers, like, yeah, you have the right to rule Mandalore, but you can't actually even control the dang Darksaber. Uh, it throws you, but you're not ready yet, you know? Right, right, right. You know, and he has to go on his own hero journey. So now, do you have to defeat the person while he uses the dark saber, or you just have to defeat the person and you get it? He could just have it lying there, and he defeats you with his own devices. I mean, that could. I mean, not being a Mandalorian myself, and huh. understanding that the Mandalorians are a very complex and differentiated people, hmm. because it should be noted that what's your name didn't. When when she first ruled Mandalore, when Kaylee Saka first ruled Mandalore, she actually was given the dark saber because she was the one who was most fit to rule. Oh, by the person who wielded it, and that's probably why she's refusing it here because she knows that doesn't work. You know, right? And and he he verbally, at least out to the universe, said, "I think you should rule." Well, yes, but the, so that, how that, different is it than how she got it? Well, that, but the thing is, is that the first time she got it, it failed miserably. So the first, because she got that back during, like so the one can make the argument that oh, we strayed from the way and we shouldn't have. Yeah, exactly. It's you know, I mean, it's sort of, it's sort of like, um, not to get controversial, but there, but there are certain groups of Orthodox Jews who do not recognize the political status of Israel. Because they feel that it did not, it should not have come because of political means. Mm. It needed to come because of, um, it needed, it needed to come because that is what, you know, there should be a Messiah who leads people into Israel and, and reasserts Israel, not that, you know, several European powers make a decision. Yeah. You know, so that, I mean, that's, the, I don't want to get us canceled here. So, um, <laughs> But there, there are people that have that view. And so when you look at this very diversified group of people, and of course, that's that's the truth in any religion. You know, you will see that in Christianity and certain people who feel that, you know, certain branches of Christianity are not really Christian because they don't embrace this perspective on things, you know. Um, and it always goes back to whatever whatever your group's orthodoxy is, well, what's interesting about orthodoxy is that you can be orthodox about anything. And you can be an ultra-orthodox Hasidim who is very <laughs> open-minded and celebratory in your orthodoxy. And you can be very dour in your orthodoxy. And it's your choice as to how you're going to approach your orthodoxy. And the same is true of orthodox Christians, orthodox Islam, orthodox atheists. There's a lot of really joyous atheists who are like, nope, nothing... Nothing exists, and I'm super happy about it. <laughs> and then there are people whose atheism just says, no, the fact that you think anything exists is an affront to me, and it bothers me as a comedian, you know? Right. It'll, it'll and then there are some me. people that are just like, hey, man, just don't talk to me about it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, to me, that's just the way to be in life. It's just don't. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad that makes you happy, uh, you know? 
Yeah, but I, 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 I barely wait, but I'm glad it makes you happy. Yeah. You know, everyone needs something to make them happy, Miles. That's what I say. Oh. Uh, so you did see Velma? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go out on the limb here. I enjoyed it. I wouldn't say I enjoyed it, but I was look like I, I thought people were mad for some reason. I didn't see anything objectionable. Yeah, it was a simple little show. I, I'll tell you, I expected better from Mindy Kaling. She's a phenomenal yeah. writer. Her work on The Office is absolutely legendary. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and then and then it makes me wonder how much did B.J. Novak had to do with it, and how much did Mindy Kaling? Because you watch B.J. Novak's latest entry, that movie Vengeance. And my God, it's so good. The writing in it is just superb. It opens with one of the most like whoa, interesting in the, uh, monologues that you you've ever heard. Uh, just a great piece of writing. Um, and and then you get this, which is like, I mean, I guess maybe it's it's tailored towards who it's aimed for. It's aimed for people that are in, you know, elementary school or middle school or whatever. I don't know. It feels that way. It's written in that language. Like everything is she, you know, like, um, well, yeah. I mean, it, it's, it, it's very much written for a culture that came of age on Adult Swim. Right. And it's very much in that vein and trying to affect it. So here is my take on it. And this is my big hot take on Velma. Um, the premise is, or to put it to someone, the reason why everyone is unlikable is because it's the start of the story. Yeah, yeah. And if, if everyone was in their final positions, there wouldn't be a story to tell. This is about how they go from being these unlikable teens raised on adult I know, swim. No, I feel like you still have to give it some subtlety to make us like the characters for some reason. You can't yeah. make them so unlikable or caricatures of what the zeitgeist hates at the moment, that it just becomes, uh, oh, oh, okay, oh, I yeah. see what you're doing there, you know? No, and, no, no. It, and the zeitgeist is definitely against the show. So it's like... Well, well, <laughs> it's so interesting. People on either side will just take something that is not really that objectionable, but gives them the opportunity to grandstand and, oh, oh it's yeah. time to roll, you know, like gather yeah. the troops, you know? Um, so... Yeah. I mean, like, one of the biggest... I mean, and there's stuff... There's, it's sort of the stuff that's like objectionable to people. So, for example, it is, it is objectionable to a lot of people that in the very, that there is a high school girl shower scene. Oh, that's what people were mad about? Well, it's one of the many things. Oh, okay. And now, I don't think anyone who is voicing a character in this is, is under 30. I don't think anyone who is written or drawn in this is under 30. The fact that the characters are ostensibly teenagers is, granted, not sexual. But mm-hmm. I was not turned on sexually by it. I understood that they were making a joke about yeah. over-sexy teen right. comedies. Right, exactly. And, and, yeah, it's like, I, I know that no teens were harmed in the making of this. And this they let you know, you know, this is the first episode. This is as racy as it's going to get, you know, <laughs> yeah. and you'll never see it again. They sort of make that point, too. And, and beyond that, like the most sexual content we get is a, is kissing. Right. And, and, and not just that, but there's a lesbian character who's lusting over two other lesbians uh, kissing. So was, I thought it was a, a democratizing of that sentiment. I, I thought exactly. it was cool. and, Yeah, it, it, it is very much a, a a thing that if you grew up in the... If you grew up in the 80s, you were very familiar with shower scenes in high schools because that's what we did in our in our Porkies and our Blue movies. It was, again, 20 and 30-year-olds doing this stuff. But because it was marketed to teenage young people who wanted to see naked people, and that's true of every gender and every group, we all liked seeing other people naked. It's a very common human trope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so within it, it's marketing to us old nostalgia buffs for that Porky's vibe. Mm-hmm. And there is overlap with the with the uh, Scooby Gang vibe in that because they came up at the same time. And now what we do see in this is we do see all of our characters in sort of diametrically opposed positions from where they are in the general Scooby Gang. So in this, Velma is smart 
as she always is, although she's not as smart as she could be, but also she is much meaner. And the reason for this is because Velma in the Scooby Gang is the most cinnamon roll of everyone, the most kind, delightful, sweet person in the group. So her ev evolution will need to take this take from going from a very dark place to going to a very nice place. And I'm sure we're going to get that as the story progresses. Yeah. And I guess that's that's my... Becoming comfortable in being herself, right? Exactly. And it's you just know? like, this is who I am, but I'm holding myself back because of guilt of this or guilt of that. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and yeah. one could make the argument that the Velma character that we had back in the day uh, was the way she was because of those feelings. It's e it's easy to make that leap. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's interesting, and this is what I will always say about you know the original the original cast of the Scooby Gang. They're based off of the characters from the Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, one of my favorite shows. Oh. Yes, because uh, in that um, Maynard is Shaggy, Dobie is Fred. Uh, Tuesday Well, Thalia Manager is um, Daphne, or just the pretty girl of the week was the Daphne. And then there was another character uh, who was called a Zo a Zoe... Z no, sorry, Zelda Gilroy, who was the Velma character. Now, the actress who played Zelda Gilroy was actually a lesbian, and that oh. actually wound up hurting her career in the long term. But, you know, as it was, she was a very sweet, overly sweet, overly kind person who falls in love with Dobie Gillis and sort of gets kind of exploited by Dobie, but also Dobie is such a sweet guy, you don't want to hold it against him in his own way. Yeah. Well, you know, but she's conniving and manipulative too. In the overall the overall arc of the, of the Zelda Dobie storyline, it actually does kind of have its sweetness and its darkness too. So, um, and they do wind up together in the TV movie they made many years later. Um, and you do see throughout it that basically as much as Dobie protests being paired with Zelda, that he actually loves her, which is not a nice way to be, but it's like, you know, you see it and it's always about her being smarter than him and her knowing that no, you do love me. You just don't want to admit it. Yeah, I guess I mean the same it, way. It, was, it was also a different time, you know. Yeah, it was the fifties, man. I just yeah. just bear with me here. Um, yeah. And like, it's but, so funny. Sometimes you know you can come back and criticize art from a time, but but art is simply a reflection of what the audience wants to see at the time, right? So I mean, you right. know, it's also an indictment of 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 all people at that time, not just the people who made the show. They were people mm -hmm. whose desire to see stuff like that got that show made. So, Well, you know, it's like I always say, you know, Jack Kirby, one of the great comic book artists, when he t came to drawing black people, he drew, he drew really offensive black people, even when they were protagonists. So <laughs> not in Black Panther, but when he did his work in the 40s, you know? Mm. He just he did didn't even think twice because that was his job and that's what you did and it it's is in like that. I mean, at, at, a, at, at some point you got to let things go you got to forgive people and you got to be willing to say hey, we're moving on right we're yeah, thank exactly. God we're better now we got to move on and that's that is one of the hardest things for people to accept in HR is that sometimes I know you I know what you're saying I know why it's wrong don't think I don't know what's wrong. But now we have to move on. And if it happens again, we can be harsher on it. But right now, we have established our, 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 our bulkhead. And now we move on from here and make sure that things don't go wrong again. And if they go wrong again, then maybe we start firing people. But we'll have to see how it goes. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't want to just fire people <laughs> because no one told them no before, you know, or that no one told them no harshly before. Which is really, you know, that's that's always the biggest problem with any kind of discipline in any society is there will be people who will say, I'm going to tell you no, but, you know, I don't really mean no. Yeah. You know, you know, just be nicer for a little while. Let's just, you know, let's stop the bleeding and we're not going to worry about it. But really, it's about let's let's really push this through and, 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 and get beyond it and do better. 
But yeah, I mean, I enjoyed Velma. Like I said, I'm not. I am. I am enamored of the characters. I've always liked the Scooby Gang as a concept. But then again, like I said, I actually like the main loves of Dobie Gillis. So maybe that's why, because it was baked into me. And but beyond that, I'm not so bound to the Scooby Gang that I can't see what they're going to do next. Yeah, I'm kind of like thinking about like how uh, the shaggy metaphor in this episode, he says, I don't like drugs right into the camera. (laughs) So, I mean, like you can see where that's going. He's going to end up being like the shaggy that we know that's, you know, always a little buzz. Well, exactly. And that should be your big hint. And that's also one of these weirdest things in this. Why did they get rid of shaggy? They and yet didn't. they tell you no exactly. It's like his name is Norville. Uh, what is it, Norville? Um, yeah, because he's not Shaggy yet. He's all clean cut and and yeah. And, well, yeah, because I'm I'm trying to remember what his last name. Is. I want to. I, I I don't think it's Jones, but maybe it is Norville Jones. But anyway, but it is just the idea that that is actually Shaggy's name. Shaggy's name is Norville. Oh, it's Shaggy Rogers. That's right. It's Norville Rogers. That's funny. It's, they got rid of Shaggy. It's like. No, Shaggy's name is Norville Shaggy Rogers. It's like that's canonically what his name is. Oh, is that right? Shaggy is his nickname. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I guess yeah. he had to get Shaggy before he could be called Shaggy. Well, exactly. Well, it's just the idea. Like, no one names their kid Shaggy. <laughs> you know, he does, although weirdly enough, he does have relatives whose last name is Shagworthy, I think. Oh. But, um, uh, well, I mean, hey. I think it's been a long time since I've been into the deep canon of original Scooby Doo, mm. but um, but you do get that his name is uh is Norville Shaggy Rogers on one of the times where he inherited something from a rich uncle, because Shaggy was always inheriting things from his rich uncles, mm. which is one of the one of the tropes of the original uh, Scooby Doo is of course these kids were loaded, but. <laughs> Yeah, you know. Um, Sounds like they're going to use a lot of uh, what's his name, uh, the rich kid. He's going to be pretty much funding all their adventures. Yeah. Oh, you mean Fred or? Fred, yeah. Yeah. See, now Fred gets a lot of short shrift, but Fred's been getting short shrift in every Scooby Doo remake in, since the 2000s. Yeah, he, but- he was always the square narc every time, right? Yeah, but he, I mean, originally he wasn't. Originally, he, he really was a leadership character, oh. and he was kind of. But you know, really, since the James Gunn reboots, mm. they really have dumbed down Fred. Like <laughs> dumbing down Fred, making <laughs> Fred into a Kendall has been the idea. And this, and this one just takes it to its logic, most logical extension, where he's all smooth, you know, and. There are people who go on for an hour on the on the internet about a very vague joke that they make regarding his penis, which is actually in story isn't that it's a small penis, it's that it's cold out. Hmm. Which, you know Yeah, but I mean like they let you know from the first the scene. joke second Scooby Doo. Yeah, no, no, but they let you know right from the first scene what kind of show it's gonna be. Like, you know, as soon as she walks into school, there's two little cockroaches doing it and they focus it, they go, You see this? Okay. They're just it's it's gonna go from here, right? So, yeah. You know what? Well, eh, I don't know. My actual deep fan theory is is that it's actually gonna be uh, everything's a botsman brain. That oh. they're all just brains that have been taken out of their bodies and put into like little little uh, tanks, hmm. and that everything they're experiencing it's actually a simulation in the Matrix. So, huh? That's my theory because every time they because that's the that's the that's the big darkness is that, oh, we keep on having these bodies with the brains taken out. Um, and oh, we also have. Right, right, right. We also have Daphne having these very vivid hallucinations. So hmm. to me, that screams, oh, we're all brains in the Matrix, you know. Interesting. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see where it goes. They're dropping apparently two episodes a Thursday. And, you know, they're, you know, they're okay, you know. Yeah. It's like, I would not say that my life would have been incomplete without them, but the hate it's gotten has been crazy. Ah. Oh, goodness. Oh. Yeah. Anything else you want to talk about this week? People just love getting angry. It's just it's an art form right now. Look at how angry I am. Look at how righteous I am. You know, yeah. I'm protecting this. I'm protecting that. 
man. Just <laughs> just worry about yourself. <laughs> I mean, really, you 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 have to. And you know what I will say for it is 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 it is it is interesting to me that people have opinions on it. Um, you know, because that's the thing. It's like. So let me give you an example, because there is something I have a very strong opinion on, and that is Mark Millar's Old Man Logan. And the, the which last is a movie, the Logan series. movie? Or the comic? I'm sorry? Are you talking about the, the Logan? The comic. So there's a comic book called Old Man Logan okay, okay, okay. that Mark Millar did that's basically set in a universe where the villains won Acts of Vengeance. And it was controlled by Dr. Doom. What? Acts of Vengeance? Acts of Vengeance. So, okay, so basically there's some deep, deep, deep 90s lore in this, but um, in Acts of Vengeance, there was this whole thing where all the villains decided the reason they keep on losing is because they're attacking the same heroes over and over. <laughs> and if they would just attack completely different heroes, those heroes won't be prepared for the attack Hmm. And now maybe we can catch them off guard and win. Hmm. It does fail miserably, mostly because it was all Loki all, all along, just manipulating everybody. Although you do get one of the best scenes in it where uh, at the end of it, um, Magneto captures the Red Skull and just locks him in a bunker and leaves him there to die. Huh. And it is it is just because, you know, in that in, in that moment... Magneto was the survivor of a heart of the Holocaust, and he's working with this Nazi expressly because he wants to get close enough to the Nazi to kill him. Sadly, they didn't let him kill him. Um, it would have been great if they had, but um, right. but anyway, but the basic premise is, is that all these villains are switching off uh, heroes, and when you actually read uh, Millar's Old Man Logan, you realize that that's exactly what happened. Like the reason why why Logan is so messed up is because Mysterio attacked the X-Men and convinced Wolverine to basically just kill all the X-Men cool. by making him think through illusions and things like that, that all of the X-Men fighting him were in fact real villains. Wow. So it was, it was pretty dark. It was pretty messed up, but that didn't bother me. What bothered me is the, the hulks that wind up ruling because effectively you have the idea that Banner and Jen Walters, his cousin, mm -hmm. kept on having sex to have Hulk children. Oh. And then those Hulk children interbred until you basically get a bunch of very inbred Hulks. And either you're suggesting that Banner is attacking She-Hulk or she's complicit with it. But oh, either Jesus. way... Either way, it's not a good story. Wow. Especially when they go into the whole plowing their own fields thing. And it's it's a messed up story. Mm. And that is why all the other adaptations have skewed very far away from incest hulks. Yeah. Um, but that is one of those moments where, you know what? It really did not do the character right. Made me very mad. But I didn't dwell on it beyond just saying... I did not like that. Yeah, well, that and was unsuccessful. Not, you know, I, I I did not like that choice. That yeah. was not because I actually knew the characters were fictional. Um, right, right. And, <laughs> and that's the thing is when you know the characters are you can say, you know, I don't like the choice you made, so I will choose to ignore it, as every other writer has since, because yeah. it just it it's not a there's not a place you can go from there, and at a certain point you got to sort of like, eh, you know what. He tried something, it didn't work. Yeah. And yeah. we can always fix it in post. We can always right. retcon it right. away right. and say, right. you know, the, well, that was mm -hmm. actually just sort of what he tells people to freak him out. Mm -hmm. But actually, because as, as many people immediately pointed out, there's like eight different other gamma-empowered women that he could have sex with, as well as other gamma-powered beings. So, you know, it's, it's not like gamma-powered people were hard to find. Yeah, but he wanted to keep his Hulk bloodline pure. <laughs> yeah, well, see, that's just weird. Then. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> All righty, Mozzie. So, 
<laughs> any final thoughts on anything you talked about? Or is there something else that's been bugging you lately that you want to talk about? No, not really. Everything seems uh, fine to me. Okay. Well, you know, I hope everyone listening to this show has enjoyed it. I hope if you are looking to give us your opinions, maybe you like incest hoax and want to defend that and make it the mountain you die on. If you do want to defend incest talks, please write to us at capesandlunatics <laughs> at gmail.com. That's oh, capesandlunatics, all one word, at gmail.com. Or call us and give us your voice extolling the virgin, v- virtues of incest talks at 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And even if you don't like incest talks, Maybe go to our uh, show notes down and uh, find the link tree. That's L A N K T R T E E E slash Capes and Lunatics, where you can buy our merch, give us money, or find any of our other shows where we don't talk, where, where we talk slightly less about insects, hogs mm-hmm. throughout the Capes and Lunatics franchise. And if people uh, do all that, or if they don't want to do any of that and just talk to you specifically, Maz, maybe to you. How can oh, they, they do so? They can email me at mozmanzor at gmail.com or find me on Facebook under Moz Manzor. That's M O Z M A N Z O R. And of course, you can always write to me in that old fashioned email way that our mothers and fathers once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet things when I feel like it at Charlie Esser. That's C-H-A-R-L-I-E-E-S-S-E-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing. Thank you, Maz. Yeah. All right, dear ladies and gentlemen, you have come to the end of another episode of Super Connectivity. Please come back again next week and super connect with us once again. Good night. <laughs>